Welcome to episode 58 of Talking Prisoner. Today we are thrilled to have with us an incredibly versatile talent who has worn multiple hats with grace and excellence throughout her illustrious career. An actress who has graced both the big screen and our television sets, a director who has shaped drama, a playwright whose words have moved audiences, and an educator who has moulded and inspired numerous students at the National Theatre Drama School. Her body of work encompasses a variety of roles across popular shows like City Homicide, Secrets, Rafferty's Rules, Prisoner, Special Squad, The Young Doctors, Skyways, and her most recent stint in The Honeysuckle Sisters and Celebrity House Cleaner due to Tim Burns, director. From 1983 to 1984, she was a vital part of Prisoner and has left an incredible mark on television history, appearing in 60 episodes. Her characters left viewers in awe, especially with the most unforgettable scene involving Officer David Bridges. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute honour to introduce our steam guest for today, Babs McMillan. Welcome to Talking Prisoner and good morning, Tim. Good morning. Thank you, Matt. I hope that was all okay. That was all, <laughs> that was all more than I remember, but so, <laughs> thank you for that. Now, um, before we get into your career in mm -hmm. prison, can we learn a little about your life growing up? Where did you grow up as a child? Well, I was I was was born in Australia, but uh, when I was four, my father was in the public service in Australia, and um, he was sent to London to work in what was then the assisted passage scheme, encouraging migrants to come to Australia after the war. So I grew up in London in 1954. And then uh, we were there for three years and then Dad was sent up to Edinburgh to open an office up there. So all in all those years of my life were spent in, you know, in England and in, uh, in, in Scotland. So it wasn't until I was 10 that I came back to Australia. So my childhood memories are really more of England and England. Scotland than they are of Australia. I had to get to know my own country from, you know, about 10 years old. And um, it was what we would know as a culture shock. <laughs> It really was. <laughs> but it shook down. Yeah. And so yeah. you came to Melbourne when you arrived? No, we went back to Canberra <coughs> where my father was based. And we had a few years there. And then he was sent um, abroad again. And we went to Hong Kong. So uh, that was when I was 13. So we had nearly four years in Hong Kong. So, you know, I sort of grew up on the diplomatic cocktail circuit <laughs> in Hong Kong, <laughs> as you did. The Hong Kong of the 60s was a wide yeah. open town and it was just the last great colonial outpost and, you know, everybody was very aware of the countdown to the end of the days of the colony. That was all looming in everyone's mind. And, of course, it was people who were the most fascinating people who'd washed up from all around the world. Wow. Having left England years ago for Africa, India in the civil services of those countries and um, come various revolutions and so on and so forth <laughs> had fetched up in Hong Kong. So the expat community from all around the world was fascinating and Amazing. we grew up in a very interesting mess of people. It was wonderful. And the city itself at that stage was still beautiful. If you've ever seen the movie Susie Wong, The World of Susie Wong, that was the Hong Kong that, that I knew oh. yeah. growing up and wow. it was beautiful. It really was beautiful. Wow. That lifestyle gone with the wind. <laughs> <laughs> what type of accent did you have? Oh, well, I, I grew up remember? in... Well, I just... Like I, like I do now, essentially. I mean, I, I had to learn an Australian accent. when I, I mean, I still lapse out of it and it comes and goes a bit, you know. <laughs> Depending on what I'm doing. I'm just talking to you now, so this is just how I sound. But, um, <coughs> yeah, so that was something else I had to get used to when it came back from, wow. you know, rounded vowels and what have you, in, in my school in England. <laughs> <laughs> what type of schools did you go to? Like what? We went to the local schools. We, yeah. we lived in a village in, um, in Surrey, growing up there, and uh, it was a lovely community, and there was a, the local school, so that's where we went. And we went to the local school in, in Scotland, which was a very different kettle of fish, the, um, where we lived on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Uh, right on the coast of the, the North Atlantic. It was the most beautiful place to grow up. We had a sort of Edwardian childhood, you know, in a way. We had daffodil fields and the beach to play on and horses to oh, ride, nice. you know, and all that kind of thing. And we went to the local school, um, which was mostly populated. It was agricultural, but it was also a mining area. And the kids came from those families. 
we lived in the big house on the local Laird's estate, so there was a lot of toing and froing with the kids. Yeah. You know, and there were dust ups in the playground. You know, you had to stand just you had to stand your ground. They were tough kids. Oh really? Oh yeah. yeah. It was it was quite a quite a difficult time. I mean, rural England and Scotland were still recovering from the war in the fifties. Yeah. And um there was a lot of family pain as well. Fathers who'd been long absent and, you know, such things which impacted everybody after the war. I remember my parents talking of such things among their peer groups. And um, so we'd be in school, which was just a three-classroom school, and there was you know, two or three years in each classroom, with one teacher in each classroom managing all the different streams. Really? Yeah. Wow. And they'd all come out of retirement uh, after the war, and so they were well into their 70s. Now headmaster was, I think, close to 80 years old. Um, so they ran a very tight, old-fashioned kind of ship, you know, <laughs> back in the day. And uh, we got belted. Wow. We got what the Scots called the torse, which is a split leather belt, which hurts like there's no tomorrow. And uh, a result of which happening that, that happening to me uh, prompted my mother to take me to school the next day and have a quiet word with the headmaster <laughs> <laughs> uh, about that. So that never happened again. Wow. But it was a very mixed school society and sometimes we'd just suddenly hear the siren at the mine would go off and the children would get up and go. There'd been an accident, something had happened at the mine, they would just go straight to the mine. So it was a, it was a really interesting, I mean I, had, I think I had a fabulously rich childhood in that, in that sense of getting very used to dealing with all kinds of people fitting into different scenarios and you know, children do find a level. Yeah, I think you know you find out and you find out how you work as a person, and that stood me in really good stead through through all my adult life. I've sort of usually managed to navigate fairly disparate collections of people in very odd situations. You know, all kinds and that's of stuff. Your childhood. Yeah, I really that, think yeah. it is. You yeah. know, we learn to be very flexible. We pack up and go. Father would take us along. Holidays on the continent. We drove around Europe in the fifties in a you know a little Ford. No, that wasn't a Ford. It was a little Austin, wow. all packed in the back. You know, me and my two sisters, and so we had those sorts of experiences. When we were finally leaving to come back to Australia after that seven years, father drove us across. We drove to Italy, and we drove down Italy, and we took ship from Naples, which was full of beautiful Italian people all coming to make a new life in this country. So we played with their kids as well and we learned a bit of Italian, you know, <laughs> one or two Italian nursery rhymes and all that kind of stuff, you know. And so landing back in Australia, as I say, after those experiences across yeah. all those years and then navigating yet another very new environment and a very different school culture and all that kind of thing, you get flexible. Was it a big shock, though, in, in Australia? It was. The culture here? It yeah. really was. It really was. Um we, you know, we'd grown up in the English school curriculums for a start, so we didn't have any of that kind of grounding in. I didn't even know the, the you know, advanced Australia fair. I didn't know the, the yeah. anthem. Um, we had, you know, we did hear things. My grandmother sent us a, um, <laughs> a seventy-eight, as you did back in the day, um, recording a record of some bush songs <laughs> for Christmas <laughs> in Edinburgh by the fire. <laughs> <laughs> which was fabulous. Um, so I knew, I knew, uh, you know, stuff like click go the shears, and, oh, uh, yeah, but, yeah. but you oh, know, yeah. but I didn't know the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been God save the Queen back then. It probably was, yeah. but I mean, we were learning. We, we learned advanced Australia. Well, King. Uh, well, what year it was, was the Queen. Yeah, it was queen, still, yeah. it was the Queen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was the Queen. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am that old. <laughs> oh, <sorry>. I. <laughs> So we, we just had to find our way, you know, and people were kind or otherwise. But, yeah. you know, kids find their level, yeah, they you should. know, and you find your peer group and you hang out with the ones that get you and you try and rise above the ones that don't, you know. Yeah. Usual story, isn't it, yeah. growing up? Mm. Yeah. Were you one of the toughies in the school, yeah? No. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't. I didn't work with my inner Cass Parker at all when no, I was, yeah. <laughs> when I was growing up. kids at that, that No, at that, no, that no, age, I didn't, no. didn't go quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> 
when you were out of school and everything before mm. acting, what sort of jobs did you did you do? Uh, well, I went when I finished high school. Um, when I was offered a university place, which I really wasn't very interested in. I already knew what I wanted to do. My parents had been very active all their lives in, in um, amateur theatre. And my mother was a beautiful singer. She she trained as a, as a young woman. And, of course, you get married in those days. That was the end of any kind of working life or career. So, um, but they loved that work. And we were very involved with that when we were kids. We helped to paint sets and, oh, you wow. know, ham, poop, move props around, do all that. And on the aisles at the Albert Hall when the Canberra Philharmonic Society was giving their Gilbert and Sullivan, we'd be there ushering with a torch. <laughs> <laughs> the ushers. Yeah, yeah, the ushers. So we were part of that kind of, of yeah. camaraderie and that sort of world and it just always felt something that really fitted, I think. And I didn't see any point in prolonging what was going to be the inevitable anyway, you know, another three years of, four years of university and undergraduate and all that kind of thing. So... Um, once I'd done the HSC, as it still was back in those days, um, I moved to Sydney to share a flat with my, my sister. We had a lovely flat in Manly. And uh, I got a job with, I had a job in the um, Department of Health. Oh, wow. Um, not having anything to do with, you know, medicine, relax. <laughs> but um, I was in what was called the Commonwealth Acoustic Laboratory. It was all about hearing aids and all that kind of thing. So I was surrounded by mad scientific boffins coming up with all kinds of new versions of what, how to help people hear better and so on and so forth. And they were a great fun too, a very eccentric group. Uh, so that was the day job. And I trained at night at the Independent Theatre in North Sydney when Doris Fitton, wonderful, wonderful woman, um, was still running that in, uh, in North Sydney. So I'd take the train over the bridge after work and, you know, go to class two hours, three hours, two hours, whatever it was. Working with fabulous, fabulous people, all from the profession, yeah. and um, <coughs> and that was that was a, a really wonderful time. It was the best training. I did do a Niger audition, I'll, I'll admit, but it didn't come to anything. And I was grateful for that retrospectively, yeah, because I think what I got, I worked with people like Keith Bain, the fabulous Keith Bain, whose story as a a movement teacher is something that should be sung loud and clear. He was an extraordinary, extraordinary man. And we met up again many years later when he was head of movement at NIDA and I was on the NIDA faculty. Oh, the irony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fabulous, fabulous man. And he was our movement teacher at the Indy. We had a wonderful voice teacher. We had wonderful acting teachers who had actually done, you know, they'd come from the West End. They'd had professional working lives. They knew what was what. And we were trained up in that discipline. And that stood me in very good stead as well because when I got my first professional job, I knew my manners in the theatre. Yeah. You know, which back in the day, I'm sure it still prevails now, but back in the day I had a certain etiquette that, you know, you really did need to know. You arrived at the theatre well-dressed. We had to arrive with makeup on. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was still, that was still the, the way of it back in the day. And is that what you'd suggest to up-and-coming actors that want to get into the industry is to break into theatre acting first? Is it... I think everyone finds their own way, you know. Those that have already started doing it at school and things like that. When I was on the, the audition tours with NIDA and VCA, um, auditioning all around the country, and we would get the kids straight from school, some of whom genuinely did have talent, some of whom were just th thinking of it more as an extension of what they'd been doing at school, but it wasn't really going to be for them. So it was interesting to think, well... What's formal training going to bring to you? How are you actually going to take this on board? You know, you've had a certain kind of discipline already in some aspects of this work, particularly voice we found could be a bit immovable with some of the kids. They had had their seven, eight years of whatever, you know. So that's not necessarily something that benefits a working life. It's a different, it's a different style of discipline. So... Um, we would simply just in, encourage, advise the best way that we could without, you know, throwing anyone's dreams out the window. It was yeah. never about that. Um, but we all, all of us, all the people that I worked with in 
actor training had all come through the profession. They'd all been professional. They'd worked for years, you know, and still are many of them across every possible discipline. So the experience that was available to these kids who were seeking their way and, you know, starting their dream lives, their professional lives, how am I going to work, what work do I want to do, we were able to subtly, I think, do quite a lot of mentoring. I mean, some of them really had to be steered right away from such aspiration, you know, not to, to be properly supportive, you know, not to encourage people to have a false yeah. hope. Uh, we, we, none of us could bear that. Um, but we found the goodies too. You know, and those were the really exciting times. You could start to see the new generations coming through, the new talent, how exciting it was, how hungry it was, you know, and how we could work with them, how open they were, and how available and willing they were to put themselves into the mix. It's rigorous. It's rigorous, a good theatre training, you know. Yeah. It's very demanding. It needs everything that they've got, and it needs their courage more than anything. Yeah. So, you know, the qualities that you look for as well as the talent. You have to be... Someone once said you have to have the talent to be talented. And I think that's, that's something I contemplate a lot as well. <laughs> <laughs> the energy. Yeah. Oh, the energy. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Playwrights, movies, TV shows. What mm. do you like? What do I like? Yeah. Oh, I like them all. Yeah. I like them all. I like working with, with all my, my colleagues, whatever they're doing. You know, the work is never dull. Um, unless you get that fabulous combination of a not very good play and a not very good director and, uh, you know, you give the read through in the morning, you go to the pub at lunchtime and think, well, we're on our own, here it is. We'll have to sort this <laughs> one out, but never mind. We'll come up with something. And, <laughs> but, you know, no, I, lo I love working with everybody. What's your favourite movie? My favourite movie? Which is a toughie. I mean, that's probably Oh, my favourite. One out of how many gazillion are there? <laughs> I don't think I've got... We play this parlour game, you know, sometimes. What, what is your desert island? What, what you know, yeah. things you actually have to have yes, in a desert yeah. island? And I try to think, what movie would it be? And I come back all the time to Singing in the Rain. Yes. You know, because I figure you're stranded on a desert island. You want to laugh, don't you? <laughs> oh, so that's what you I take on the desert so. island? Oh, yeah, it's oh, my <laughs> desert island movie. <laughs> No food. I watch it. No, 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 no. Just, just as long as I, I can, you know, die laughing. Die laughing, <laughs> dancing around the coconut. Absolutely. <laughs> Making myself laugh. <laughs> Love it. Favourite film. Yeah. I know we push for time. Should we get into Young Doctors? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, Young Doctors. Young Doctors. Yeah, yeah Young Doctors. But your first screen credit was a show called Silent Number. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, it was. Do you, yeah. remember, do you remember that? My vague memory of it was Gregor Taylor. Doing yeah, Gregor. Yeah. yeah. Did I'm, you remember what it was about? Well, I think. Because um, on IMD, was, IMBD, it says you played a prostitute. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was no, well, no, high class call girl. High class call girl. Yes. So. <laughs> How <Yes>. much? <laughs> I know. Well, we'll have, to, we'll have to think about that, won't we, <laughs> won't we sir? <laughs> yeah, she was a high class call girl who was kind I think it was a kind of sting. Um, yeah, that's that's really all I can remember. I remember that I had to supply my own clothes, <laughs> as we did a lot of back in, back in the day as well. So did you borrow it off? Oh, well, I had, I did actually have rather a fabulous um, full length dress that I wore a lot, which was for its day V daring because it tied across the front and ah, it had a bare oh, right, midriff. Wow. wow. And spaghetti straps. So which it was is nothing compared to that. Now. Sounds great. No, 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 I know, honey, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know. Positively overdressed compared to these days, but it sounded, you know, it was fine. It was fine. It all worked, and yeah. it kind of helped me because it because it had a kind of sexy feel to it. And um, I think the scene was with Grigor or with with no, I think it was with the guy they were trying to entrap. I think it was that kind of scenario right. from vague what I very vaguely remember. I can't remember unfortunately who that was, but it was a very fun scene to play. And uh, we could just get sleazier and sleazier, <laughs> you know. There was so much whispering and it was all that kind of thing, and, you know. And I think it was Roger... Roger... Was it, was it Roger Myrams? Was it Roger Myrams? Who, who was, he was the producing film director on it and was. was directing as well, I think. I think, I th I think it was Roger. Yeah, it does sound like it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I think it was Roger. And uh, it was fun. I do remember it being fun. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
after that, uh, <laughs> by night, that, so that was mid seventies, I think. Yeah, I way know a few back other in the day. people that were in way. Silent Number, but um, by mm. nineteen eighty two, you took the role of Aaron Cosgrove. I did in the Young Doctors, yeah. um, and it was it had been on air for some time and had yes. a huge following. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, at that time slot, did you audition for the role or did it just come your way? No, no, no. Um, it came my way. Um, Fabulous. It was, yeah, it was fabulous. I was living in Melbourne at the time, and of course, that all came out of Sydney. And uh, yeah, it was. It was a lovely one. I really enjoyed it. And I moved to Sydney to stay with other chums who had a big house up there somewhere on the North Shore. Um, so commuting back and forth to the studio, which was in North Mel, uh, North Sydney in those days. Yeah. And um, actually, as a you know, down on the. Kirribilli Point round that neck of there was Milson's Point that's right that's the name of the station it was at Milson's Point so of course we had the trains rattling by overhead and it was the 70s there was no soundproofing in the, in the studio <laughs> no it was no it really wasn't it was just a, an empty space that had been fitted up you that know as the studio wow. and they had some um, I mean obviously they had you know stuff around the walls and things like that but it wasn't by any means completely soundproof so sometimes there'd be there'd be the train rattling by overhead, <laughs> but um, we mostly we mostly had to put up with the fact that it was wasn't air conditioned or, or heated either. Oh, the really? Heaters came in, you know, standard ones came in for us during the, the cold months, but the summer it was just open the doors and it was really 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 hot. Wow! And the quite ancient cameras just kept breaking down. You know, they'd get overheated and we'd have to stop. Redo scenes. We do things or, you know, try and do a pick-up. No, we'll have to go from the top, you know, that kind of thing. So oh, wow. a lot of time spent in the green room, gossiping <coughs> with gorgeous people like Genevieve Lemon and Michael Gowell. You know, all, we were all starting out and yeah. finding out our feet as we started to get a bit mature in the business and started to actually, you know, have people think that maybe we could work with them. Mm. Wow. And so, you know, sort of how it goes. Jen was actually cast in the first production, Steaming, in Australia while she was on... The show on the Young Doctors. On young doctors. I found an interesting fact with the Young Doctors. So it began in November '76, a week earlier than another new soap opera on Network Nine called The Sullivans, which we all know, yeah, produced Sullivans. by Crawfords. Uh, the Nine Network made it clear that only one of the series would be commissioned beyond the initial 13-week production run. The Sullivans, which had a three times greater budget, after the trial period emerges a critical success. So the Young Doctors was cancelled. But however. Fans back then lobbied Channel Nine to have it back That's on right. the air, yeah. which I, I wasn't aware of at the time, yeah. and uh, become one of the Australia's longest running popular series yeah. at the time. Yeah. It was over thirteen hundred ninety-seven. Oh episodes. yes, yeah, yeah. Oh. The, the time that I joined it was actually what proved to be the final year of it, the last season. So I was thrilled to be a part of it, you know. And that was an historic moment in the, in the life of Australian film when it, when it finally came to an end. Yeah. So to be a part of that was very special too, and the cast were fabulous, really well, wonderful. Well, at the time, it was actually the longest running Australian soap opera. It was, yeah, on yeah. a commercial network. Up yeah. until then, it, it surpassed number ninety six. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. um, and was the longest running, I think, for a few years. I think Prisoner mm. then took over that, mm. and then yeah. you know eventually Country Practice. Mm. Gwen Plum, yeah, memories of Gwenny. Yeah. Oh, Gwenny, <laughs> she was she was fabulous. You know, she was fabulous. Memories of Gwenny, God. She was just, you know, she was just one of those quintessential professional people. She really was. She was fun and mad and, you know, <coughs> great off camera. But as soon as, you know, we were on the floor, it was all business. She loved everybody. Everybody loved her. She knew everyone. She knew what was going on. If anyone had a bit of trouble, you know, there's anything like that. And she was really the kind of the heart and, show, uh, and soul of that show, you know, in, in every way, professionally and personally. Yeah. She was just gorgeous. Wow. She really was. Mm. And big prisoner connection. I mean, obviously, mm. Reg Watson created the yeah. Young Doctors. Ian yeah. Bradley, yep. uh, who I was just with yesterday. Uh, Kendall ah. Flanagan. Kendall. Who everyone talks Wonderful about. Wonderful Kendall. Prisoner. Um, yeah. And Chris Adsed. Yep. Chris. Chris, yeah, Steve wow. the Man. We <laughs> see. <laughs> The wonderful Steve Mann. Steve Mann um, as well. Steve wow. Mann was, I think Steve was my first director, I think, if I've got okay. that right. Um, first director that I had on, on prison. And I was really grateful for, for Steve because 
when I got the character breakdown, I'd already done a little role in, in Prisoner before, you know, as, you, as you'd know. Yeah. Uh, so I was offered this. It came to me as an offer and it sounded, you know, fabulous. And I said, yes, 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 of course. And as I got the first couple of scripts and I just, I just couldn't quite find my way into the character. I couldn't put it into, I couldn't put it into a context somehow. Um, there was just sort of something missing. I, I couldn't get it. And I was really very nervous on my first day because I really didn't know what I was going to do. And um, Steve came up to just have a introduce himself and, and you know have a chat, and which was lovely. And just he said, "Okay, we're we set up for the take. You know, we're going to get ready to do, shoot my first scene." And he just he just talked me through the action, and he said, "You know, the thing to remember is this: she's basically a really good person. This is stuff that's happened, but she is a good person." And that just, that made sense to me. Then, and it helped me enormously, actually. Because I, I played that scene and it, it, to me I thought, yeah, now I know where this girl's coming from. All this has happened. There's a, you know, a, what do you call it, a quirk of, of temperament that's, that's extreme. But it's not what rules this character. You know, she does have another aspect. You know, we're always looking for those sorts of things in character studies and stuff but I just hadn't been able to find the hook and Steve just nailed it for me wow you know that to me is a good director we used to love Steve's blocks we loved them all you know <laughs> they were all fabulous but for different reasons you know yeah Steve was that <coughs> cute <laughs> <laughs> he was our throb a you know? throb our, our throb, throb. <laughs> our throb. <laughs> Well, Gorgeous will, man, they lovely women man. In prison after all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything with pants? Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, true. <laughs> Did you know anyone in the cast when you joined? Like, oh yeah. Were you, were you looking forward to working with? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yes, you know Betty was there and Phelan arrived and um, Ju darling Judy McBurney, sweet yeah. thing. Oh yes. Oh, and um, uh, Colet Man was still around and the fabulous Caroline Gilmer was around and oh, it was old home week. And then Tina Bursell arrived. We'd been in Godspell together in 1842. All right. And you know, <laughs> she fetched up as a, you know, the next person to torture my life. So, yeah, it was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and of course, Maggie. I was yeah. on tour with Maggie Kirkpatrick in 1971. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. We were on tour around New South Wales. Um, when what was back in the day, the Arts Councils of the day, you know, we were on tour with a, with a folk opera called Flash Jim Vo, one night stands around New South Wales. <laughs> <sighs> it was gruelling, <laughs> but it was fabulous. We had so much fun, so much fun. Fabulous wow. playwright that grew up, Nick Enright, who grew up to be that wonderful playwright, oh, was yeah. our ASM, <laughs> <laughs> just starting, you know, finding his way. Yeah. And oh, Jonathan Hardy, wonderful actor, Jonathan Hardy, he, he played Flash Jim, and Flash Jim Vo was the piece. He played Flash Jim and he was a scream. Yeah. So we just laughed from one side of New South Wales to the other. <laughs> it, was, it was just fabulous. <laughs> also, Russell Crowe got his first uh, acting gig on Young Doctors as well. Daddy, there you go. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, there's a career to, <laughs> to wonder at. Yeah, good on him. <laughs> yes. Good on him. We better get into Prisoner. Let's get stuck into Prisoner. Yes. Prisoner. Prisoner. What do you want to know? <laughs> want to take it off, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you played Cass Parker, I believe. That's oh, correct. yes, yep. I did. And, um, you cut someone's head off at one point. I did. How did that feel? Oh, sometimes you just have a bad day. Just you know. a terrible day. I think I'll just terrible start decapitating day. screws and, <laughs> and <laughs> watching heads roll, Parker. Oh, yes, literally. <laughs> Parker. Actually, when we posted your uh, your upcoming interview, that was one of the so many people were asking about this scene. So, uh, yeah, it was great to oh, get into yeah, it. Yeah, great scene. Well, mm. Well, the storyline, as everybody will know, you know, about the psychotic, psychopathic yep. warder that we had. It was the sweet and gentle David Walters <laughs> <laughs> giving his psychopath. And, um, yeah, so that w when we came to shoot that scene, I mean, David already had to go through the horrors of having a full face mask done to make the head. 
So his face was covered with plaster, two straws up the nostril, and it was that kind of thing. And it was it's horrible. Really spooked yeah. him out. Yeah, well, that's how it was done. Yeah, that's oh, how it was oh, done. Well, getting so a face mask, it's, it's really, it's like yeah. being buried alive. It's really? awful. Oh, it's it's a, a, yes, watch. that's what he said. He said it was really claustrophobic, and he said I was really starting to panic when fortunately they, you know, they they got enough they could take it off. But um, yeah, so that was used to make the head itself. You know, it was <laughs> that suddenly <laughs> the final shot, as they say, and. Um, so come the day, the actual uh, filming took place in a proper garden shed, the real garden shed, the back of the channel <laughs> team. Yeah. It's still there. It's yeah, still it's still there. I know. Yeah. Oh, should have a plaque on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the prison garden. You know, we used that when we were out doing the prison yeah. garden. We used to hate the prison garden. Um, oh, was that? What, oh, what? oh, just because you know, maybe outside. Oh, it'll be hot. It'll be cold. Yeah, it's typical. It was always yeah. uh, yeah. always. Well, a lot of them were done first thing in the morning. Yeah, they were. The, the fog coming out. Of I know. Place. I mean, hello. <laughs> well, oh. What was a, a Holiday Island that was filmed as oh, well? Oh, Holiday Island was Girls on the. Girls in bikinis. They, and that was right. They were on the. They were at the <laughs> channel at the same time that we were. <laughs> Yeah, that's what they'd they put ice cubes or something in their mouth to stop the the fog coming out. Well, you'd be sunbaking and you'd have goosebumps. Oh, it was a great show. Shot it through every it. filter under the sun, I think. <laughs> get the lumps off the skin. Uh, they even used to green screen the ocean oh, in they? certain scenes, yeah. Yeah, well, so, they'd have had to. Yeah, yeah. So they'd have this shack and I think, what's what's his name? Frank Wilson? Is it Frank Wilson? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The guy from New Faces yeah. originally. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he played so. this guy who had some beach shack and they'd green screen like this surf. <laughs> out the, it was, yeah. Why not just film it on the Gold Coast? <laughs> Actors from but, Melbourne won't travel. Yeah, budget, budget, budget. <laughs> budget. <laughs> budget. <laughs> <laughs> Runny's had budget. budget, budget it was Crawford's, actually. Oh, Crawford's. Crawford's, <laughs> mm, yeah. So, anyway, back to the garden shed. Um, yeah, as I say, it was a garden shed with the yep. usual, you know, physical constraints, as we say. It was not a set that there was no breakaway wall to give us more space. There was nothing like that. It was the garden shed. So, it had to accommodate me and David and this and sound and camera, um, you know, continuity. I mean, everybody had to be able to see what was going on. And um, also, what really we really had to keep in mind was to keep it safe for the arc of the shovel itself to be realistic, but in no way threaten David, yeah. you know, at all. So ha- the shots had to be really carefully. Well, you understand such things, you two, you're filmmakers. Well, not me, Tim. <laughs> well, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so and all that had to be thought about. So it was a long day. Um, and we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. We, had a, we also had the, um, can't remember his name, our fabulous fight arranger, Chris something, I think he was. If you're looking to this, sorry, darling. Um Again, to to coordinate the moves in such a way that we could we could sort of you know body pat the choreography. We weren't we yeah. weren't we weren't flying anything. You know what I mean? It was this was laid down. We knew exactly where we needed to be on any given moment and where the shot was and everything. So there was a lot to remember technically when it when it was being shot. Um, and then we had to put the acting on the top as well, you know. So there was a lot going on. It was a, it was a full on day. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very hot day. It was and it was it was a clear day, but it wasn't hot because everything. Oh, there was light in the in you know stand lights in the shed as well. It was all, all happening. So um, yeah, so we spent a lot of time on the prep. We did we did we did it, and when we finally felt confident to go for it. Um, we were all pretty much of the mind that we really did not want to do this twice. You know? yeah. <laughs> we really wanted to try and nail this one once because it was quite traumatic as well, yeah. to tell you the truth. Um, so we all settled, everybody, you know, um, everybody right. We all ready to go. We ready, ready, ready to go. Gorgeous Uncle Uncle Ray, Uncle Rabies. Uncle Rabies. Yeah. <laughs> Our fabulous floor manager. <laughs> Uncle Rabies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they were all fabulous, our crew. Oh, man, they were fantastic. Yeah, that, actually, that's one thing I've learned doing this podcast from the start. Every cast member talks about the crew that in such a positive. crew was the best. I mean, <clears throat> the floor ran like clockwork. It was fabulous, you know. Uh, and they were just a joy. Yeah, Everybody was so relaxed, you know, they knew their job. We had fun doing it as well. But came time to do the job. 
everyone was all over it. It was fabulous. So it was the same in this particular moment, of course. And so Uncle Rabies, you know, called for silence. And, you know, he, as I remember, just a little thing that he did. Um, when David felt ready, uh, David just, just gave it. I don't know what they, but there was some signal, uh, I think, that had been set up. So Ray would then call action. David was ready. So, um, so was I. So we went for it. Wow. And we did get it in one. Amazing. Uh, Were you we, nervous going into that scene? Hugely nervous. Yeah. Hugely, hugely nervous. There was so much that could go wrong, but we were so well prepared by everybody that worked with us. Yeah. That uh, we simply had to kept our, keep our heads and do our job, you know. It was all, everything else was in very, very good hands. We didn't, you know, yeah. we only had one thing to think about. <clears throat> Uh, and that was each other. And David uh, was wonderfully generous, actually, in that respect. I mean, there was never any of that kind of thing, you know. He looked you in the eye. And so it, the scene arced up amazingly when we actually started to do it, you know, and it, and, it, and it kicked in and both of us got the rush kind of thing, you know. And it felt really strong and it felt really powerful. And... Um, the, the, the scream at the end it just well I mean I don't know where it came from yeah some other fan actually mentioned oh, it just it, like it came from the bottom of your lungs oh I did, it did it did just, it did and it was yeah. just and it was about many things I think back can I think <clears throat> about a lot of things so then there was just a nerve wracking few minutes while they check the gate that's you know with the film travels through you know and that there's nothing, there's not a hair. Hair in the gate's the last thing you want to hear, you know, <laughs> after a scene like that. So when we got gates clear, we all just erupted. Wow. Everybody stamped and cleared and chat and hugged each other and, you know. It was it was it was quite a day. It really was quite a and day. Did you watch it back when it came on? No. No. I watched when I, I watched it when it finally went to, to air. To air yeah. yeah, but I didn't want to see it back then. It was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine it would take a lot out of you as an actor. Oh, it, it did. That, that, that rung us yeah. out that day. That, that, I think it was the only scene we had to work that day. I might have been a you know, non-speaker in the background in the laundry or something else, but I didn't have any other big job to do that day. Yeah. I do remember that, that was scheduling. Was very, yeah, it was very smartly done. Yeah. yeah. It was good. Oh, but I must tell you, the, the payoff, to the payoff to the decapitation was at one of the prisoner events. Oh, the head. The head. This was on eBay. And I wound up on eBay. <laughs> and I saw that. I know. I know. But a, f a fan approached me at a, a fan convention. He didn't get you to sign it, did he? He didn't have it with him. <laughs> oh, he didn't have it. He didn't have it. Oh, he, he didn't have the head. He didn't have it with him, but he had it at home in his little private um, <laughs> museum of prisoner that he's made in this spare room in his house. He's got the head dead pride of place. Wow. Which I fan that is. How would he have gotten it? Like well, well, apparently what he Channel said to me. Channel 10 props? Or? No, what he said to me, if I, if I recall correctly, was that he just found it um, in, the, in, the, yeah, in, the, in a skip. They'd done a props room clear out, you know. I mean, how many times you're going to need the yeah. head of a certain actor? <laughs> 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 so he just, you know, souvenired it from, from <laughs> some, something like <laughs> oh, look, you know, we all have our quirks. Yeah. <laughs> True. We but, do. You know, loitering around Channel 10. Finding hair. Fin fin finding well, hair. I don't know. We never had much of a conversation whether he'd actually been, a, you know, working oh, around the, the channel yeah. for any, on site for any particular reason. I never really knew anything about him. I was just a bit gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there once <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, would have been back then. And... Um, on a kids show and I went for a little walk around Channel 10 and I looked through the bins and I found a stack of um, photos from the behind the scenes of oh, wow. prison. There you go. And I took them to school the next day and said, oh, look, this. And, of course, what the photos were of weren't hadn't gone to air yet. So this is like oh. a good six, six. And, and we're looking and going, why are they having a fate? <laughs> and all this sort of thing, and it you was know, a fate in prison. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, and, all, was. All, and so they didn't oh. come on air until six months later. And I, yeah. I recently scanned them, or maybe a few years ago, scanned them and put them up on 
oh, Facebook amazing. or something. Yeah. Oh, like good that. on you. And um, they went, you know. Kind yeah, of thing. But yeah. Who did I show? Was it Ray Lean once years ago or might have been Ali? And they said, oh, that was – so it was everyone was having a party and eating and all that sort of thing. And I think I think it might have been Ray Lean who said to me that was Judith McGrath's last day. So oh, there was a yeah, party. Yeah, yeah. So that's why there were oh, so many photos because okay. there was these huge salads and Sheila was there and – but in the background, there was actually a cardboard cutout of you. Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Holding something like a... Oh, I, did, did, I, did, 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 you, do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember it. <laughs> yeah, I like do remember everyone's it. sitting around. Maxine's there. Yeah, you, Max you know, is there. Whatever yeah, there. And, and, there's, and there's a cardboard cutout. Yeah, I Casper. souvenired it. <laughs> <laughs> I had it from, Do you know I have no idea what happened to it? Yeah. It disappeared. I've got no idea where it, would it have went. Would have been amazing. But I, I did. I had it. Yeah, when I when I when like I life size cut. Yeah, yeah, life size. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you get the part on Prisoner? Did you have to audition for that? No, I didn't. See, no, I, I was offered that. I think because of the, what I'd done before and probably doctors, subsequently, yeah. you know, um, uh, and doing that little bit in the show already, you know, I, Miss I knew Ford, that, I think it was. Yes, yeah. it was a social worker, I think, or yeah. something like Do that. Do you remember much about that? Wrong. No, not really. It was it was a one scene, I think, and I mean, I was thrilled to do it, you know, because it was. Was that for Doreen for Colin? Oh, I don't I can't remember. I think from memory, probably yeah. Doreen was always in some kind of crisis. <laughs> 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 so you didn't audition for uh, Cass? No, no, it was uh, went and had a meeting, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it was it was. Just, Straightforward as that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a difference between the production scheduling between the Young Doctors, which had you know, compared to Prisoner? Well, only in the sense that Young Doctors, we did very little OB. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were usually yeah. studio. studio. It was usually studio. Um, we very rarely went off site to do do anything else. But um, Prisoner, we were off OBing a lot. In fact, the first thing every time we got the next two week schedule, the first thing to see would be to look at your OB scenes, you know, because <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Betty Bobbitt being schlepped up to the Dandenongs at seven o'clock in the morning or something hideous like that, when we were shooting that scene when we're up in the scout hall doing something. We go to oh, a, the, I, uh, I can't Glee remember. Club, the Glee the Club, Glee, scenes, something yeah. like that, and, yeah. and we have gone from it, you know, and we have to run away through the Dandenong Hills and fall over in wet leaves. <laughs> oh. She was not, not, not a happy camper that day. <laughs> she really wasn't. None of us were. It was freezing cold. Oh, especially up in oh, so yeah. cold. And, like and moist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Misty. Misty. You know. I mean, it was very beautiful, but, oh, yeah. you know. Speaking of those scenes, though, you worked closely with um, Wendy Playfair, who we've interviewed, who played Minnie Donovan. What was it like working with Wendy? Oh, Wendy was a scream, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she is. She, uh, <laughs> she was very... Very interesting woman as well, you know, as well as a, as a lovely actor. So we had a lot of laughs. Cause it w and it was good because Cass and Minnie were a bonded pair, you know, as, it, as the storyline went. And um, she, she, was, she was great fun. Yeah. But she used, to, she used to get a tiny little bit confused because she'd done a great deal of radio. Yeah, the radio plays. A great yeah. deal of radio in, in her life, you know. And um, was a very good actor. But sometimes she, <laughs> she'd say, now, in this cut, uh, and they'd say, what, love? <laughs> because, no, that's radio talk, we'd say. <laughs> when, that's radio talk, darling. We're doing a scene, love. There's going to be camera, you know, face. <laughs> 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 you say, oh, yes, of course, of course, of yes, yes, yes. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. The only thing she couldn't do, um, was, you know, she's supposed to be a card sharp. You know, a con woman and all this kind of thing. And there was a close-up scene shot of Min, you know, shuffling and fuzzing the cards and doing all <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, of course, that was never going to happen. So those hands that do those particular scenes belong to our... <laughs> oh, they weren't her hands? This, no. <laughs> no. Just a cutaway they, to some expert. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was top up. Uh, second, second um, you know, floor. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he had beautiful hands. So he had to go... <laughs> so it was a dude's hands? Yeah, to top up, top up. Who was you know lovely, sweet, gentle top up. Uh, called top up because he, you know, we'd be at the pub, of course, having a drink after whenever, and uh, get <coughs> get another one, darling. Oh no, no, love, no, I won't have another drink. No, just just top this one up. Top this one. <laughs> so top up. top up, he he was. So those were top up's hands. 
You had to go to you know get the shaved and all that and get the nails done. <laughs> oh gosh. Get the oh, nails oh, done, the nails a bit of makeup <laughs> on them, you know, re reading ring on and all this kind of thing. And then that, so that, that's why it's shot in such tight close up. Because <laughs> I don't, don't know how sharp, you know, far up the wrists they shaved. But anyway, so anyway, yeah, yeah those, those man's hands. Well, that's funny. What about when you were playing um, snooker? Did you, was, it, was it a close up or did you actually get the ball? No, in? I actually got that, but it was lined <laughs> up meticulously by Top Up, who was you know, up. quite, quite, Top the, Up's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> oh, he was very good. And he'd tell you how much strength it would need to, you know, how hard I needed to. Manipulate exactly how to get it. Like so he'd be lining me all up like this, <laughs> and away we'd go. And I got everyone. I know. Perfect. I know. <laughs> Been watching prior to this interview, you know, sporadically episodes mm. here and there in prepare, you know, preparation for today. And there was a scene that stuck in my head with a cat. Oh <laughs> yeah. And it was <laughs> like it looked dead when you find it. <laughs> like its tongue's hanging out. Did they? <laughs> oh well, there's a story there. <laughs> <laughs> that cat was alive, um, but I can't remember. Can you remember what the story? Just remind me what the storyline was. Uh, Mrs. Did O'Regan's got a cat, and Cass is looking right, after yeah. it, and I'm looking after Maxine it. Maxine drops it on the floor in one scene. <laughs> like Maxine really. drops it, and then I think you find it, and it's dead. I think, and it's like literally. Like, That's right. I mean, did they give it a sedative? Or yes, something? they did. When it, and it was the cat. <laughs> This cat that belonged to um, a friend of one of the crew or something like that. So it wasn't a professional cat. It was a borrowed cat. Borrowed cat. <laughs> um, and, yes, it was done. I mean, a vet was there to do it, of course. But, yes, the cat was anaesthetized. The owner didn't know. No, I didn't know that that was what... <laughs> Well, he didn't know that that was what was going to be done, but the owner was there. The owner was there. And okay. so it was explained to him what needed to be done. Um, and so, yes, that's that's how it, how it was. It was actually sedated, yeah. Is that why they start putting things on the end of shows? That no animals were harmed during the shooting of these, these yeah. episodes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sedating cats. Well, so they should, particularly after well, oh, those kangaroos yeah. being shot in wake and fright. <laughs> oh yeah, well that's right. Yeah, yeah. But um, were you there with the snake when the snake came into the prison? I handled the snake. <laughs> oh, you handled it. Yeah, what? I had I had to deal with all the livestock because uh, you know Cass was oh, a, you were a country girl. Cass was a country right. girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> were you a country girl at heart or completely? Me? Yeah. Like, a, did any of that resonate with you? No, not particularly. Nothing. No, okay. I I'm more of a town rat, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, oh, yes, the snake. Um, mm, I actually had to wear it. I remember wearing the snake. After it was, because didn't, like, Fritz have to put it in, a, in the freezer? Oh, yeah, it was in the freezer. <laughs> and then, And yeah. went just before, and, and it, it had to come out just so you could bend it probably. But <laughs> <laughs> it had to come out, uh, it had to be, act, I'm trying to remember what the scene was. I know it wound up around my shoulders, I think. Do you remember that? I think it did. Well, I, I certainly had to handle it, and I, th I think this, that was what happened. And so it came out of, of cold storage just for a couple of minutes so that although it, it was animated, it was, you know, you, you could work with it, but it wasn't lively. Yeah. It was just a beautiful, I think it was just a rainbow python, you know, beautiful, you know, mm. no, no, no sort of venomous anywhere. Um, beautiful snake, actually. And it was really fascinating because I'd never held a snake. And as it started to come warm up under the lights, just carrying it and holding it, the f you could feel the power in the body because it was quite, it was a big snake. You know, it was not, not your yeah. tiddler. It was a proper size, drape mm. it round your shoulders type snake. And the strength as it started to move and it just rippled in your hands, it was quite extraordinary. I thought it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> so I got to wear the snake. I got to the cat. I had a... I had something else at some stage too, didn't I? I think I had a mouse, mouse. or a rat or something. Yeah, yeah, mouse, I think it was, yeah. <laughs> oh, they did that. Like yeah. when if there was sort of like a, you know, someone who was a bit mental up there, they'd give him a pet mouse. Or, <laughs> or some therapy. Sort of, because they did therapy. that. Therapy, therapy yeah. animal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> therapy animal. Because didn't the other one, what was the name? Merle had a, had a mouse at one point that was, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. muscles yeah. or something. Muscles, that's right. So <laughs> what, was your, what was your mouse called? Did oh, the, oh the freak killed it, didn't she? 
Probably. Or someone did. <laughs> Probably. And there was a bit of, you know, red nail polish on the on the mouse's oh. nose. And, um, something like that. I can't yeah. remember what its name was now, I'm sorry to say. Do you remember your uh, first day on set, what it was like? Yeah. It was good. It was good. Um, everybody was... Well, the crew, of course, were fabulous. Yeah. Made sure I knew everybody was. Wardrobe I knew, so that was nice too. Wardrobe and makeup were fabulous as well. My makeup <laughs> essentially consisted. Was that Jennifer Car Jennifer Carmen, the wardrobe mistress? Oh, I can't yeah. remember now, darling. I'm ashamed to say. That's okay. Doug, Doug, gorgeous Douglas was our makeup artist, and his gorgeous sidekick. Oh, sorry, names are lose. I'm losing names. But Douglas, when I I'd go to makeup. You see, I didn't have any makeup, <laughs> but I would always go to makeup. And you say, sit down, darling. I sit down in the chair, so now, um, all right, I'm just looking. I'm just looking, and I'm, it's fabulous. I don't have to do a thing. <laughs> and they say, oh, oh, just one, hair, darling, hair. So he'd just muss up my hair, you know, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's hair and makeup. Yeah, that was makeup. Yeah. Or sometimes, if he was feeling, you know, that I really did probably need a little attention, he'd say, no, darling, darling, just, just hold still, hold still. Because you're not used to this. <laughs> and they'd be perfect. <laughs> Powder puff. That was my cup. Just for the shine of the end. But at life. the end of the day, at the, uh, particularly at the end of the week, we're going out for drinks. And we, if we finished, you know, at a scene maybe early afternoon or what have you, we'd hang around for the after gig drinks. We'd go into makeup and Douglas would do the works. You know, we'd go out looking fabulous. I'd do all the makeup to go out. Oh, we'd oh, do wow. the makeup for us. We'd go out looking fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> he was a honey. Absolutely gorgeous. So, Fantastic. yeah, first day on the set was was really good. Yeah. It was really good. It was good just to be back at work with, with people that I knew. And you would have been nervous at all because you've worked with many of well, them. Well, no, not, not – I was nervous about – not about the people thing. No, no, I yeah. wasn't nervous about that environment. I was just nervous, as I was saying, about – quite how to start but when I got that wonderful note from Steve that just fell into place and then yeah. I did I did enjoy the day yeah and I enjoyed the whole shoot I, I had a really fabulous time on prisoner I loved every minute of it yeah I really did great 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 people to be with and we always had good scripts good writing stuff to really work with you know and some of it was really quite challenging some of it was just fun <laughs> you know making we had kitchen scenes there was always a Mess, you know, there was always some frightful mess that I'd either caused or Doreen had, you know, there'd be something like that going on. That was on. the actual kitchen for the canteen. It, it was, uh, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the Actually, thing that strikes me quite strongly with the character um, is, and, and knowing you personally as well and having worked with you and all that sort of jazz, but like you look nothing like the character in real life. Yeah. The physical transformation, how did you achieve that? Because that is so hard. Was it? You look different. Mm. You, I, and I get, you know, the, the whole sort of, you know, maybe centering your body from a different area and having a different walk, but that physical transformation that Gary Oldman does pretty well, how did you do that? What, what do you do? Was that intentional? It was intentional. Yeah, it was very, very intentional. She had to ha have, Cass needed a physicality very different to mine and um, a physical... Um, attitude, very different to mine. And what, just to talk a little bit, you know, might sound a bit pre pretentious what I'm about to say, but um, sometimes when you work on something like this, I do anyway, depending on, you know, how you work, um, but you start to think about how the body, why is the body a different shape? Why does it need to be a different shape? And the thing that, that is, you know, this wonderful emotional centre that we have and this chest which is us you know all these things that we present to the world when we're confident people that what we say in um, Feldenkrais lead the body these retreat in people who have different in environmental impacts and different relationships and responses to people and she struck me as being a very damaged person she'd already yeah. you know killed by the time she was in Wentworth and um so there was a lot of baggage there and it was bowing her down in ways that needed to be physically reflected. Um, so the voice was different as, as well. 
And when I discovered that I dropped my weight and, re- and into my hips and let my center collapse. Wow. It rounded my shoulders that little bit, you know, and the head had a different position. It fell naturally into a different place. And then she started she started to feel in me like um someone who'd who'd taken a lot of knocks and had sort of life had kind of beaten her in a way. So the moments when the rage came into her in the you know, various parts of the storylines that emerged for her. That changed her again. So things would shift and she would she would turn back into a different aggressive, you know, stance. It would change, it changed everything. So um yeah, that that's kind of how that how Amazing. it came it, how it came about. Just again from from the backstory of someone <coughs> who's just saying the right thing. She's basically a nice, yeah. good person. So it's everything that's happened to us had a real impact and it's got to be there physically. And the voice sounds completely different. The yes, yes, the voice was, was very different. Mm. Yeah. Did you mm. work on that prior to getting to set? Like did you receive <coughs> the script? Did you get a character brief and sort of yes, work yes. on it at home in front of yes. you or whatever? I, I, I did. I, well, I did. But as I say, I, I was still groping. I was still sort of fumbling around trying to find the physical aspect and how she sounded and and it really was someone just giving me that hook, mm. just that good director yeah. saying the right, giving me the right note at exactly the right time. That everything I'd been mulling over and sort of messing around with myself had a center to it and it came together and I could use what I'd been, you know, experimenting with and sort of exploring. It came together and I felt that then I, this is how this person looks and now I know how this person feels. Um, and did you feel that sort of once you, you did that sort of, you know, altered your body that you could easily switch on and off from the character? Yeah. Or <coughs> yeah. It became like a Feldenkrais pattern. Yeah. You know, something you could just shift in and out of. Wow. So yeah. you didn't sort of feel, oh, I need time to derail myself. No, no, exactly that. right. And and, it, and same way technically, you know, you just move out of it again when the moment's over. You don't want to live in that space. No. Wow. Mm. Um, Gerda Nicholson, sadly no longer with us. What beautiful. Everyone asks about Gerda. Beautiful. What was it like working oh, with Gerda? Oh, she was a beautiful, beautiful Gerda. Beautiful. Oh, and such a lovely actress. You know, that sweet nature, that kindness that, that informed that character, that was Gerda. Yeah. You know, and she was fun and a little whimsical. You know, there was, she was a charming woman. She had charm. Yeah. You know, she really did have charm. She was warm and... Mm. Yes, we uh, we loved Gerda. Yeah. Mm. Well. And learning your lines. What's your technique for learning your script? Oh well, you know, back back in the day. Now it needs you know a team of surgeons. <laughs> but back in the t- <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> you need a microchip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> back in the day, it was uh, look. You just did it. You know, and because you knew the character so well. Uh, and you learn yeah. you learn the smart way to do things. You know, if you're not shooting that scene that day, you don't learn it. You learn it the night before you're going to work it. By the time you've done a couple of runs on the floor, it's in there, you know. Yeah. You shoot it, it's done, and then it goes. So um, I learned that the hard way on Young Doctors. Um, I think I never, I'm never going to remember all this. I'm never remember all this. I'm never going to remember all this. And I think it was Gwenny um, who just said, oh, darling, no, you don't, you don't have to learn. Oh dear, just you know, get ready for the next day, love. What are you thinking? <laughs> you know, get a grip. I think. So, <laughs> so that we're going. You know, wonderful professional note from a, a dear old pro who yeah. just said, "Oh, for heaven's sake, don't be daft." You know, don't learn the whole thing. Daft, oh, don't learn the whole thing. <laughs> crying out loud, you know, you're not going on stage and doing it all in one hit, like you know, we're, we're so used to doing. So that was a, that was a, again, yeah. another great technical note. But you do, you just we just learned it in the and in, and you learn in the doing. Yeah. Um, you do so much on the page. You know, you know the words, but it's in the doing of them that they actually sink in. Because yeah. you because at, at the moment, in that particular moment that you're shooting on film, they're the only words that make sense. Yeah, you know that's what the scene. Is. That's what the scene is. So that's what you. So that's what's there. Yeah, so some things thing. change from the script to what you actually shoot. Some, sometimes things would. Yeah. Um, sometimes at the readings, at the read throughs. There would be maybe a continuity thing or a what character the thing. Done? Were they done at the studio? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just very informally. We yeah. just read through the, the next week's script. 
But sometimes something would just jar and you think, no, or no, actually a couple of eps back, what I said to so-and-so was this. Okay. You know, so now I really can't say that. Yeah. Um, uh, or you just, a phrase would be out of place. You'd say, no, that's, not, not, that's something Cass would never say. I'd never say something a bit highfalutin, you know, or, yeah. or a little bit, uh, a little bit more sophisticated than I might ordinarily think of as her. So things like that, we just straighten them out on the on the day. There was never any aggro with the, yeah. you know, writers being precious or anything like that. <laughs> we had wonderful writers too, fabulous Denise Morgan, you know, all those people that wrote yeah. for the show were wonderful. Yeah. So they very rarely got it wrong. Yeah. But it was just from our kind of, uh, you know, insider knowledge, if you like. If something didn't fit, you could was out of tune, you know, in some way, we'd just sort of bring it up and we say, could I say so-and-so? And Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> Did you ever get a script and go, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that must kill Bobby. Yeah. We, yeah so I saw, and then I, then I remembered I was going to be hypnotised or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it all became clear. <laughs> 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 you know, be ready for, be ready for, ready, ready for anything. It will happen. Did you have a favourite storyline on the show that you did? A favourite storyline? You know, one of my favourite storylines, brief and all as it was, I actually loved I enjoyed all of them, but I really loved a storyline with Charlie. Oh, Charlie, yes. My yeah. sweet boy from the country. Yeah, we all thought you were going to run off and marry. No. <laughs> you decapitated someone instead. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed that because it was just a different, very different side to the character, you know. And um, beautiful Daryl was such a sweet person to work with, and he had that soft, country, accepting, boyish, gorgeous thing going on. You know, he's just adorable. And um, I really enjoyed those few scenes that we had together, and I loved that story for her. Yeah. That there had been other things in her life at some stage which were gone now. They'd never come back. Yeah. She's never going to get out, you know. And... Um, I felt it was a, just another really lovely aspect of the character. Yeah, it was. Mm. It was nice. Mm. What do you think of that storyline? Um, very sweet. Very sweet. Yes, <laughs> it was very, very sweet. Very sweet. Sometimes it's nice to see, um, you know, I don't know, the characters get a bit of dick somehow or something <laughs> like that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't he go into the tent or something in the fate from memory? It was... Oh, uh, it was at the, the fate. I can't remember. Pixie exactly. was a clairvoyant, Judy... Oh, that uh, would have been the fate. That was the, the fate. fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so. that was the fate. That was that was fun. That was a funny day. But you had a fate that was run by prisoners in a high maximum security. Oh, was it a high maximum? Yeah. Well, well, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> well, folk like me wandering around, you'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> a decapitator and a juvenile delinquent and some drug pushers. Uh, and yeah. I don't know who else was in multiple there at the time. murderers, prostitutes and thieves. Well, that's the thing that really stands out with prisoners: the fact that. I don't think people realise, and from day one, that you are up watching a show about hookers, murderers, <laughs> uh, you know, arsonists, kidnappers, whatever, you know, yeah. child abusers, but you actually, forgerous, you actually love these characters. Mm. Lizzie yeah. was lovable, yeah. Cass was lovable, you know, and, you know, whenever they were demonstrating or something wrong happened, you were on their side, yeah. on the baddie side, you know, but at the end of the day... You don't want these people living next to you. you know? <laughs> Who would want to live next to Lizzie? You know, she'd clear out your grog, she'd steal something. You know, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But they were heroines yeah. in mm. the show. And I think that's brilliant the way that's actually done. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, we spoke about this last night. I think, I think that's, that's yeah. very clever. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That no one was one dimensional. Those no. characters all had, you know, really complicated and. You know, flawed as well. Very deeply flawed, yeah. complicated lives, you know, <clears throat> and were products of all sorts of, you know, everything, oh, every aspect of their lives had resulted, yeah. yeah, had resulted in where they, why they were where they were. And I think that, was, that kept everyone very human. There was no sort of, I never felt that there was any kind of judgment in any way on any of those characters. Some of them were appalling people. Yeah. You know, some of them really were. But they were what they were, and society had dealt with them, and so you know this now is were. is is where they are. Yeah. And this is the life they're living. Yeah, mm. you know we wanted them to get released. 
No, you did. Yeah, want no, them yeah to, you know, of course. When yeah. in actual fact, you know, they, they shouldn't there. be released, but you wanted them to. <laughs> but that was like sort of Joan Ferguson's character too. I mean, sometimes you, all the bad things she did, but you sometimes felt sorry for her. Yeah. On some storyline. Well, ultimately, she was really us. She was a misanthropist and, yeah. you know, believed that they should be in prison and not mainstream society because they were criminals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, can you trust them? They'll be back in here. They'll do this. They'll, yeah. they'll screw up. So. Exactly. She was yeah. an interesting character, you know, one of those, well, as you say, an aspect of that kind of misanthropic thinking that's channeled into one part of life. But, I mean, in her in her self and in her other life, there were aspects of that character as well that were soft and, you know, so that you'd never suspect of the freak on the job. Yeah. But there was another side to that character as well and a difficult relationship with her father and all that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, so that I like that about the writing, yeah. and I think that's what kept, you know, kept our fans really hooked in because we they were people. And still hooked now. I mean, oh, the show's absolutely bigger hooked than in ever, now. It's bigger than ever, you yeah. know, because it's yeah. still about real people, and when real people are the same then as they were, you know, forty years ago, and we just shot that world's as mad as it ever was. You know, all those sorts yeah. of things just resonate with people and make yeah. sense. That's true. Now you did uh, sixty episodes, roughly. Uh, I think it was sixty. Uh, yeah, did you – why did you leave? Why? Yeah. Well, I did think that we had been on such a huge story arc, frankly. Um, I didn't quite know where else. That was it. It, <laughs> <laughs> it really could, you know, go. Um, maybe later down the track, uh, you know, after a spell in, in – where, where, where did they send us? Was it Ingleside? The, the but, 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 criminally insane. But, yeah. yeah. Barnes thingy? I can't remember. Barnhurst. Barnhurst, was yeah. it? Barnhurst. Uh, I thought maybe, but that story now never panned out. So, um, no, and, and, um, and then I was, I was offered some work back in the theatre as well, which was particularly interesting and I really wanted to do. So yeah. we, it was a very mutually um, happy yeah. Decision. There was no, you know, nothing left behind. Yeah. It was all clear to everybody that this, this was good. That was it? Yeah. This was good. <clears throat> it had worked the way they wanted it to. I was thrilled and you know very yeah. very honoured to have to have played and to be a part of it. I mean, it's it just it's it's Australian TV history now. This show. It is. Yeah. And uh, so it's something to be proud of. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, I, I, th I think Maggie Kirkpatrick said in one of the interviews we did with her that. You know, had the show not ended, she would have left at that stage. She felt that that yeah, the character had gone as far as it could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that um, I think they did finish it at a good point. You know, yeah, you still cared about them. Storylines were still strong. You still felt sorry for her going still, to jail. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you Max. also disliked a character, you knew the actor had done the job well. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. Know, that you really hate this character. Why am I feeling so much hate towards this? <laughs> well, you believe in yeah, that person. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, did you watch it at all or were you aware? Oh, yeah, we used to watch it. After you'd left, like in the pr following years? Uh, did you, like, well, but no, no, not really because um, nights were in, in the theatre. <laughs> oh, yeah, and of course you couldn't record it. Well, time. well, I could, but I frequently forgot to. <laughs> I mean, uh, and then... Oh, then I just got on your video back then. I just yes, yes, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. got too busy, and then I was working in Brisbane, and then I went back to London. So wow. Mm. Shall we uh, get into the fan questions? Some just fan questions. Oh, yeah. fan yeah. questions. There was a lot of fan questions, oh, so I've bless. tried to pick out the best ones that we sure. could. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. Wonderful um, list of you've got a lot of fans. Oh, how sweet. a lot of fans. Oh, <laughs> lovely people. Yeah. How lovely. You want to keep them off? My oh my, really looking forward to this interview. Loved, absolutely loved Cass. Would love to have seen her return back to the show and that scream she let out after decapitating Bridges in the shed was phenomenal. What a set of lungs. <laughs> <laughs> I think he means these <laughs> things. Um, he didn't see Silent Number. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a set of lungs on that screen. Must have come from the pits of her boots. <laughs> I'd love to know if Babs pitched her character on anyone. Pitched? Is that a right word? Pitched. Pitched her character on anyone she knew at 
the time or maybe base yeah. the character. Is that, that what he means? Yeah. And that's from Darren Hembro, who's uh, Darren in the Hembro. UK. Yeah. Uh, well, short answer's no, really. Yeah. Um, like, no, I didn't. I No, no, I didn't. I, I really had to think about how to um, put it together, really. It wasn't a... Um, uh, it's a very complicated question. Really. <laughs> well, Mark Harry from... I'm not sure where he's from. He's written, Is it true, as stated in Betty Bobbitt's book, that you got inspiration for Cass from Of Mice and Men? And if you and if you did, do you think that the tragic end for Cass was as suitable as Lenny's was? Mm. You don't remember that? <laughs> Certainly don't remember. The fans remember more than uh... Betty. <laughs> Mice and men. Uh, that's okay. If you don't I'm not sure no, where, that's, where that's, that's come okay. from, I'm afraid. I can't um, quite relate to that. Um, no, so... Um, did I have a, a model for it? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, Sarah Cade said, how many takes did it take to film Cass's final scenes? I love that sequence, which I think was in the, the hospital final scenes. Yeah, I find I wind up in the fetal position somewhere. Yes. Oh, that's when, um, yeah, I, I did watch that the other night. Yeah. And um, it's at the end of the fate. Yeah, it's an interesting episode because all these characters throughout the episode just sort of – it's a resolution of quite a few. It must have been contract yeah. time. Yeah. And then suddenly the next episode, all these new faces yeah. come in. Oh, yes. yes. So in that ex- – I think there was – yeah, Cass exited and so did Ray. Yeah. Rail, Rails left in that episode too. And yeah, Rails moved on. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't a great episode. She ends up in fecal position and, and yeah. Ray gets smashed, over, smashed the over the head. I can't, the horse. I can't remember what the circumstances were. Why – had I been attacked again or – I can't remember why. I just remember that last scene. Something had happened to the character, I remember, because there was also a, a shot – I think Kendall – Bobby loses a baby and she goes mad and yeah, and then attacks uh, – what was the Yorkshire Dennis guy? Crookshank. Yeah. Yeah. Nigel Bradshaw. Oh, Nigel. Lovely Nigel. Yeah, I caught up with Nigel just recently. Did you? Yeah, Did you? Yeah, yeah. We had, oh. we had lunch. He, great, oh, yeah. Gorgeous, He was man. here for a few weeks. Oh, sweet Nigel. Yeah. Um, I do remember, I don't remember the, the, the um, scenes in detail, but I do remember that, that was a, there was a se- series of them. It was really quite, it was quite an emotional thing. And it, I think Kendall directed, I think it was Kendall's block. Um, and he wanted to do quite a lot of tight shots. Have I got? Am I thinking the right things? Possibly, yeah. He did. He wanted because he um, he really wanted to see. You know, he wasn't interested in the big acting. He wanted yep. to see the the inner, the inner workings of what was going on, and um, and he was very sensitive to the whole context of that work and where it had to end up. And I remember it really being a, a, a very cohesive um, time with him. It just, it, it one thing kind of went, I don't know whether he'd scheduled it deliberately, but, or I'm making this up, but I think it was almost shot sequentially um, because I think he, I think for my sake, to tell you the truth, because, you know, Kendall was a sweetie. Really yeah, was a sweet, very Kendall. sensitive yeah. to, to the sort of really looking for the moments where you could just tweak the the emotional level that little bit more, without getting it into schmaltz or corn, yeah. you know, but but just keep the really human aspect of it really strongly focused. He was very good at that. Um, so it was it was wasn't hard to shoot, but it was. It was demanding. I mean, you know, the work is demanding. We know yeah. that. But it felt very true, you know? And so it, it actually was easy to do. And I felt at the end of it that it was a really good resolution for that character. Sad and broken and, yeah. you know, where did she go from here for crying out loud, you know? Yeah. 
And I thought that was a really good note to leave her on. Yeah, it was. Mm. Stuart McKen, <coughs> who's nice, um, writes, I'd, I'd love to know if she was happy with her, I guess that's you, were happy with the exit, and were you ever asked to return? Well, yes, I was happy with the exit, as we just said. Yeah. Uh, well, down the track, as it turned out, no, um, because my life moved in different directions. So basically, you know, the show went on and it was fabulous. It maintained all its standards. It was terrific. Um, and I'd moved, I'd moved on. Yeah. Literally, I'd moved away as well. So I was back in the UK working there. So, yeah. Um, I don't know how I'm going to pronounce this. <laughs> Shani <laughs> Bailey will just say, loved Cass so much. Thank you, Babs, for bringing us such a great character. I'd also like to know how it went filming that. Well, we just spoke about the David Bridges scenes. Mm. It stayed with me for years as I watched in the 90s when I was about 12. I'd put my little black and white TV on and watch <laughs> at 11, 10 p.m. <laughs> laughing out loud. My dad would go mad as I'd fall asleep and all he could hear was the theme tune coming from my room. <laughs> I think it sounds like all of us. Are you in touch with many of the former prisoner cast members? Well, I am. We've lost a lot, of course. Yeah. Um, I actually had a phone call from Maggie just a couple of days ago, um, catch up with her. I still see Raylene. I see a lot of rails. Um, in fact, we've kind of reconnected in the last 12 months or so. She went, uh, when she left the show, she went in a different direction and, you know, as I said, I was all over the place. But we kind of came back together and it's it's one of those wonderful friendships which just picked up where it left yeah. off, you know. And it's yeah. literally years, years and years and years. It just picks up like it was yesterday. It's like it was yesterday, yeah. you know. We yeah. still shriek with laughter about the same things and, you know. <laughs> She's great. She's fabulous. She's great fun. So I see rails. Uh, um, Ellie, I still see a little bit of, of Ellie Ballantyne. Uh, but... About it these days. That's it, yeah. Genevieve's living in Sydney now, of course, and oh, I've seen I've seen the lovely Caroline over the years, lovely Caroline Gilmer. I've seen Caroline on and off over the years. She's yep. she's fabulous. She's in great shape. Yeah. Tim. Pete James Daling, one of my faves. Such a lovable character. Really looking forward to yeah. this one. <laughs> and then Martin Friedman says Babs looks fantastic. Oh, <laughs> very kind. Which was a, a lot of people said the same thing. Obviously, we just took some out. Um, Davy Johnson, massive fan of yours over in the UK, said, oh, yes, can't wait for this one. Hi, Babs. Thanks for doing an amazing job on Prisoner. Cass really was a brilliant Sweet. character. I'd like to ask, did you ever get hurt during your fight scenes as they seem so realistic? Love, Davy Johnson in the UK. Ah, uh, You know, we never did. We never did. We had a brilliant fighter ranger and um, the big ones, of course, in the rec room and stuff yeah. like that, you know, which were choreographed when each of their lives there, but they knew what they had to do. And um, no, no, we never got hurt. We, we, we could sometimes sort of get something that was a, you know, a bit early or a bit late, which might land a little bit hard, but no one ever suffered a real injury, which was, you know. I heard there was a few real slaps on the show. Though. Oh, there were a few <laughs> slaps that landed, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, you know, you just sort of cut it too fine instead of and hitting the hand, you hit the face. Skin. You get a bit of skin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Simon Krausen, not sure he's from. I think he's from, from the from UK. UK. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these fans are from the UK. Yeah. Around the time she, Babs, was appearing in Prisoner in the UK, they were also showing her episodes in The Young Doctors. Oh. At the same time. At yeah. the same time. How's that? For, uh, wow, overkill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say duplicity. but like, <laughs> um, And you got to see what an incredible acting range she had. Couldn't be a more different character. Oh, isn't that kind? It is yeah. kind. So I don't, I'm not familiar with your character in The Young Doctors. Uh, was she, what was she like? She was a former army nurse. Oh, an army nurse. Wow. She'd been in Vietnam. She'd served in Vietnam. Um, and so she was a disciplinarian and, um, but with a twinkle in the eye, you know, very good nurse, demanding of her staff. She was, I was, I used to terrorise Genevieve Lemon on a regular, <laughs> regular basis. Oh dear. 
Were you like the head, like a Cornelius Francis Yeah, Francis's I was type? matron. Yeah, okay. I yeah. took over from Corny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, I was the next matron off the rank, is it? And I had wonderfully spiky relationship with Alan, Alan Dale's character. Alan Forrest, Dale. was it? Do- Dr. Steve Forrest. Dr. Steve Forrest. Forrest, yeah, yeah Dr. Steve Forrest, Forrest. yeah. Um, I'd known and worked with the glorious Michael Beecher for years before we fetched up on Young Doctor. Sweet, sweetest wow. thing. Sweet thing. So, um, yeah, but she she was a different type. I mean, she was a strong woman in a in a professional world in a way that, you know, Cass never was. Um, so they couldn't have been more, more different. Yeah. And they were both, but they were both very good roles to play yeah. you know they both had real dimension and and were fun did they have um, medical professionals consult on yes. young doctors just yeah. for the authenticity of story actually or? one of the actors who played oh I can't remember the character's name yeah, she was a nurse she was she? a nurse yeah. yeah and so she would advise on you know okay. the, so, the so called clinical and medical yeah. procedures and stuff like that you know She'd uh, she'd ha- had to advise um, Alan at one point when he was doing a had to do one of those thumps on the chest, you know, to res- resuscitate, oh, resuscitate <laughs> some long suffering extra, and um, but he, he you know he came at it like that from over his head and cr- would have crashed onto someone's chest. She said, you, you know, you know, you fracture someone's sternum and flatten their heart long before you restarted it, kind of it's, thing. Yeah, you can actually kill someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. like when th- when you're acting that. Um, oh, wow. There's got it's full on OHS. Right, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got to yeah. make sure you're not yeah. touching any, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to make it look like you're actually, yeah, so you're actually doing, yeah, but yeah. you're not yeah. even touching them. Kind all, of thing. all in them. I remember um, it was on a medical show years ago, and oh, I think my wife was dying or something, and the actress started, and the nurse nearby just went, "Stop that!" <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> I guess I think wow. She, oh, yeah. like she goes, "What am I doing? Don't touch her. Just <sighs> go like that." Yeah, so oh, it's wow. pretty Ooh, hardcore. Scary yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Kurt Essex or is it Essex? I Essex? think it's Kurt Essex. Essex, yeah, yeah, Essex, Essex Kurt. Yeah. Hi, Babs. How did you put the gar- character together in your head to portray Cass Parker? Where did you get influences from? Yes, obviously the character was written for you, but you put her together in your unique way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I get the influences? Well, it's like it's the... Uh, you know, actors get all their information from the storyline and the script. That's that's everybody's starting point. You know, you can't um, make something up without, yeah. you know, a starting. And that's where it starts from. So you look at um, how she speaks, what does she say, what doesn't she say, how does, how does the, therefore, so she speaks that way, what is she thinking, mm. you know, uh, so you start to think about thought processes. Is it particularly sophisticated language or does she, does she use very simple language? So then you think about you know, how she's gone through life. Has, she, has it been an underprivileged life? Has it been a tough life? You know, not much, maybe not much parenting, maybe not much schooling, you know, stuff like that. All of those things that impact on, on the way people wind up, essentially, you know, how, we, how we develop. So you just look at things like that in that kind of slightly clinical way, but then you start to think, well, therefore, what sort of character, what sort of person is the result of this kind of life? Um, and then you, you start, so if you start bringing those thoughts to actually reading the script and using the words uh, that the writers have given, that in turn informs you more and more then about, well, she's not very confident, so how does she move? She's not very. Um, she's very aware of the fact that she's got this streak in her that can erupt. So, how does she feel about that? How does she go through life? Does she go through life afraid? Is she is she afraid of herself? You know, is she afraid of her impact on other people? How violent she can be? She's had terrible proof of it. So, all those sorts of things. Yeah. You know, you just start. Uh, allowing to influence and to inf- inform actually how how you actually use the use the, <coughs> the the words on the page. Yeah. Do you would you would you consider going on that? Whoops. Would you, do you consider yourself to be an interpreter as well as an actor because you're interpreting 
the script in your do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Interpreting. Yeah. In I think I think most actors are. Are interpreters. I think yeah. they are interpreters. You are interpreting, as you say, in the living in the living, what a writer has in their head and has put into a written form. So then the next step is how do you animate that if it's intended for performance yeah. or, you know, stage screen, whatever. So that's yes, that is you are interpreting the words according to your understanding and you're hoping that it's on the same wavelength as the writer. It's not always, of course. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Interpretation mm. um, and acting are very, very much inter interwoven. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Mm. Did the writers ever get involved? Like come and say, oh, no, Cass wouldn't have done that. They, they're like, they've seen it come to air. Because we now know like writers, they're all working in the same studios now. Back, but back then the writer's office was completely away from the studio and things like that. So did they ever get involved at any stage to talk to you about the character? Or? Uh, yeah, not, not that I recall. I mean, sometimes if, if there was a real... Um, you know, kind of inconsistency, some really some plot line that, that was really right off kilter, which was, you know, you know, to wavy blue moon for heaven's sake. I think sometimes the writers would, would sometimes be on the floor. Um yeah. I think sometimes Coral <coughs> would 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 be on the floor. Some I think Denise would co occasionally uh came maybe just to watch some stuff or something like that. But they no, they weren't a heavy presence around what was happening. Yeah. Um and you know they, they'd done their work and they'd done it well most of the time. Yeah. So you know they Fantastic. let us get on with it. Yeah. Chris McDonald says, yeah. "I would love to say Cass was class, so <laughs> gentle, and cared class, about her too. friends. <laughs> she cared about her friends such as Bobby." Just a comment. I would have loved to see Cass back when Anne went to the mental hospital regarding Reb and mentioned she'd seen Pixie. I really thought Cass was going to marry Charlie and leave Wentworth. Oh. And then Faith stepped in. Lol. <laughs> this actress. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> What's funny about having a nervous breakdown? <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, this actress is unbelievable. Well done, Babs. Best ever. All my love, Chris from the UK. Oh, God, it's beautiful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. How wonderful. Could have been a spin-off with you and Charlie, couldn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Bonnie Davis Shacko said, what a fantastic choice. I would love to know if she had any difficulty starting in a show that was so well established, which I'm, we, we sort of touched on. You mm. didn't. Mm. Yeah. Last and question. Terry Rogers. Hi, Babs. What a fantastic portray put, put, excuse me, portrayal of a wonderful character, Cass. My question is there must have been a lot of focus and drive go into such a complex character. Did you go into character before the camera roll to bring out the best portrayal of Cass and stay in character between scenes? Reason I asked that I knew of an American actor in the States that would be so dedicated and focused in his role that once he got to work and started getting his makeup on, he became that character for the whole day of filming with an Italian accent to give the fans the best portrayal, portrayal he could. Regardless, well done on your achievements over the years. No, oh, thank you. Uh, no, no, I, um, I mean, when we start rehearsal, of course we rehearse in character. Yeah. You know, but um, because when you're doing, you know, we, we were doing two, two and a half hours a week or whatever, whatever it was that we were actually shooting, um, scenes would be from, uh, you know, maybe uh, another day or another, you know. So it wasn't always very helpful to be in that particular, you know, in one particular mode, if you like. Mm. Um, so, no, once the scene was shot, safely in the can, move on. Yeah. Do you feel that they, like, I mean, staying in character for like a whole week shooting a miniseries or whatever this guy was doing in America... Do you feel that that could be a dangerous thing to do? Like, is it like, do you believe that you're in the moment 90% and then there's like 10% where you are the actor Absolutely. in case you harm someone? Right, in a exactly scene? right. I mean, quite honestly, there has to be. Yeah. There does have to be, you know. Um, like, if you're 100%, you've got that space. Exactly and there's right. There's David's head there. 
exactly What's right. What's to say that you're not going to actually knock exactly it off? Exactly right. Like, no, <clears throat> that's exactly the point. You know, yes, at the end of the day, you know, the, I keep saying to my students, you know, you're an actor, not a feeler. Mm. You right. know, you use your emotions yeah. to animate and to drive another type, personality, whatever it might be. But you have to keep a grip on the fact that you are the doer. You know, it's you are doing a job you, and you're doing it for the for the observers. It's not for you. I don't care whether you're dying on the inside and all the rest of it. If I'm sitting out there, I want you to make me feel that. Right. So, you know, that's the contract with the audience. Yeah. I want everything that you've got when I'm sitting out there. You, so that's how you have got to share yourself and you cannot give 100% of yourself eight shows a week. Yeah. You just can't do it, you know. And the actors that, I mean, there are, there are you know, numerous stories of, of very dedicated actors who do live yeah. in the role and what have you when things go terribly wrong. I've heard, I've heard that. I mean, mm. I know James Gandolfini from The Sopranos. He, he had to take three years off. Yeah. I mean, he put stones in his shoes when he had angry scenes so he could have that, oh. you know, be walking on stones in his shoes just to have that, that those look on his face. I mean, the, the dedication from... Yeah. Or wasn't it Laurence Olivier? Was it during Marathon Man where Hoffman oh. had teeth taken out for the yes, role? and. Dear. And, so and then yeah. Olivia just turned around and said, my dear boy, why don't you just act? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> or something like that. I think Rail told me that story. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. The best note I ever got from a, from a director, <laughs> still makes me laugh to this day, um, we'd done everything, you know. I mean, everything was, we were going into preview. It was all working, you know, it was all absolutely fabulous. And everybody was doing terrific work and all that. And he just said to the company, he said, well... All I can say to you at this stage is just act better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> act better. Yeah, act he's, better. He's a prop act. <laughs> yeah. So we were all acting better. Wow. Yeah. I think um, the senses is more important, is, is, is incredibly important. Like, for example, being able to recall the smell or the touch, or if you've got a bag and it's meant to be luggage, it yep. should be heavy. Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. You know? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to bite into something, feel the taste. Mm. You know, I mean, I've bitten into dog biscuits in scenes. You know, well, like do you uh, do that regularly, or only when I'm hungry. Okay, okay. <laughs> but um, what are you some better biscuits? Do, do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> the, the the dining room scenes where you got all that awful food, which mm. was meant to be hot, but clearly it's cold. Mm. Yeah, you know, like you act like it's hot. Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. It, did, did, how do you find that? I mean, it's, do you do sensory recalls or is it just too fast to sort of... It's too fast, <laughs> usually. I mean, you know, if, if, you're, if you're working in a three-hour play and these things are crucial, it's a different technique that you've used in rehearsal. You know, when it's not something you can just plug in, I don't find anyway. Sense memory is, is something for the, for the work. You know, you don't, if, if you've done the proper work, then you, you, it's there when you come to the moment every time that you do. So you're not dragging something up out of yourself again. It's already in, you, in that performance's DNA, if you like. It's there, it's available. <coughs> it will inform the moment truthfully yeah. for who's watching without you shredding yourself. And that's, you know, that's to me, that's good acting. Yeah. And I think another... Um one that really stands in my head too are the exits and entrances, yep. particularly in Prisoner, which is the laundry, the governor's office, the reception, the rec room. They needed to be coming from somewhere else to get to there. Get to this. Yeah. 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 So, you know, if you're walking into the doctor's surgery, you've come from there. You've got to, you know, I think that's really important. There were times where it's just like, why is this just person walking into the scene? <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, like, uh, they, hasn't, they haven't been directed to say, right, well, you've just come out from the cold yes. or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know. And maybe, it's, you know, it might, it might be a pickup from a scene you've shot the day before and it's actually a, the next scene. So there's, you know, there should be a feeling of continuity yeah. as, as well. You know, where did you, where were you when we left you? You're still in that state, but it, you know, it might be 24 hours later. And you've had a perm. And you've, yeah, you've had a perm. <laughs> yeah. You've had a, you've had a haircut <laughs> and, and a spray tan. Uh, but apart from that, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you're right. You're right. I know we've got to wrap up uh, with time, but just before we do, um, 
Uh, we've still got some time. We're okay. Yeah, another couple of minutes. Okay. Um, Charlie and Boots, great movie. And someone's actually put something up on YouTube and just edited parts of just the prisoner cast that were on that movie, uh, Val Lehman and Annie Phelan and yourself. What was it like working on that movie? That was oh, that was mad. We shot that up in Emerald. Oh, I was in Emerald. Okay. And um, there ain't a lot in Emerald. <laughs> 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 it was stinking hot. I remember that. And um, Paul was Paul was 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 doing well, but they were they were wonderful with Paul. Um, and uh, what's his name? Shane that? Jacobson. Shane was yeah. terrific. You know, he yeah. really kind of bird dogged, made sure that that um, Paul was was coping well. Um, but I mean, it was just such a funny scene. Yeah. You know, just, just just seen out of nowhere, went nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, you know, just um, what sort of, you know, who winds up in a in a, a diner out in the middle of yeah. Whoop Whoop, <laughs> flogging barramundi and pineapple. Oh, <laughs> you know, so it was just a hoot. Yeah, <laughs> we could do anything, and uh, the boys just sat there looking stunned. You know, what mm. was going on around them? It was great fun. Yeah. And, and, and seeing the prisoner cast was good? Well, the only one I saw, um, Annie was around, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Annie was around because... She played uh, the truck driver. Yeah, then. she was the truck driver. Yeah. She was up there the same time I was. I, I yeah. was only up there for two days, I think. She'd been up there a bit longer. Um, but she was the only one I saw. So, you know, we hung out a bit in the hotel, you know, love. But, oh, God. <laughs> it's another world up there, I tell you what. <laughs> Haven't been for a while since yeah. the Ash Wednesday fires. I haven't oh, been back. Oh, goodness gracious me. But it was yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was great fun. I've, Fantastic. Uh, let's see if I see. Yeah, I have seen the I have seen the film. I thought it was a sweet film. It made I thought it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Um The Honeysuckle Sisters and Celebrity House yeah. Cleaner. Ah, oh, Honeysuckle Sisters. I really enjoyed that day. And I enjoyed it because it was one of those jobs where you had to you had to be specific. You had to be, be specific. This, the character that needed really to be really clear and and simple. You know, it wasn't didn't need a lot of acting and detail. It just needed to be a really good person connected to these kids and loving these kids and really worried about them and and. Uh, so that that was that kept it it kept it easy, you yeah. know. I, it was just lovely. I really enjoyed that day, and um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing the the whole thing because I uh, yeah because <laughs> you know it's just 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 a, a solo act really. But um, mm. yeah, it would have been difficult for you because on the day the um we'd already shot the the boys that you're looking after so you're basically acting to nothing so yeah. and the same with celebrity house cleaner i think oh, well, i was actually with myself in celebrity <laughs> house cleaner. she was one of my favorite people is definitely myself as far as that character <laughs> yeah. is concerned <laughs> and everything i say is gold <laughs> i can't get enough of the sound of my own voice <laughs> that was great fun yeah that yeah. was great fun We've all known those, those sort of, you know, characters in our own yeah. lives, whether they're actors or, you know, business people or whatever they are. Yeah. And uh, so I just had fun with that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, we did. We laughed a lot <laughs> We that laughed day. a lot <laughs> 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 that day. Oh, it was so much fun. And it just, you know, it, it just made us think, didn't it? Because um, we talked a bit about this, you know, about the people that come and go in our world and, yeah. and you know, how they come and quite often why they go. You know, for whatever reasons. But it was interesting to talk to to Tim because he's got ideas for all kinds of oh, amazing of stuff. Ideas, you know, yeah. that that drives that wonderful mind. And so it was it was good to sh to just sort of hang out and be do sort of pro talk. You know, it was fun. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, really did. I did too. I was I was laughing a lot. I enjoyed editing it too. Did you? <laughs> By the way, I think I had a whole weekend where all I saw was your image and your voice for about three or four oh, days. Poor <laughs> darling. Oh, okay. oh, I was drooling. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So no, you're coming fun. back for season two of Fabulous. Celebrity House Cleaner. Can't Amazing. Wait, and 
fantastic. Yes, we're not going to give any ideas of baby. He's got a very funny idea. Mm. Can't wait. So, no, I can't wait either. It's going to okay. be great fun. Fantastic. Well, that was episode 58 of Talking Prisoner. It's truly been an honour to have you here and to learn about your life and your career. I, um, I mean, I'm just a fan myself, so to be sitting in the same room with you and Thank talking you. to you about your life and, and Prisoner and all the other shows has been truly an honour. So I, I do thank you from the bottom of my oh, heart for um, being here and talking with us. Oh, it's been my very great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you and thank all you gorgeous fans that love us so much, give us so much pleasure after all this time that you still appreciate our work. That is precious. So love you. Thank you. Amazing. And thank you, Tim. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Babs. What are we going to do now? Go um, play some pool? Or? Uh, <laughs> play some pool. Or play some pool and sedate some cats. Yeah. Cleaning, so sedate some cats and, clean and out the g- some heads. Oh, no, I think I have to clean, clean out the garden shed. <laughs> well, I better wrap this up. That was episode right. 58 of Talking Prisoner. Thank you for watching and please help our channel by liking and subscribing and share this interview everywhere you can. This will also be available across all the podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, and wherever you get your podcasts from. And also, please like all our social media pages, including TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And this will also be available on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much for watching. I used to give her roses. I wish I could again But that was on the outside And things were different then We built our world together Sharing all the love we'd known Till I had to face the nightmare of Waking up alone On the inside the sun still shines And the rain falls down But the sun and rain are prisoners too